Coming up, I test out the ZXC4 cartridge. I play some games. I chat to Alan. Look at a new book. And end with a type in. Let's get on then. Released to the public in 1983 as a way to provide instant loading of games and a high level of piracy protection, Sinclair's Interface 2 had a short-lived life. There were only 10 games released for it, and it had many limitations including the most important one, apart from the price of the cartridges that is, in that it could only handle 16k games. Other cartridge interfaces appeared, but were still stuck with the 16k limit due to how the data is loaded into the Spectrum's memory. Years later, and that limit was removed, and several interfaces were produced that allowed 48k games to be installed and loaded. In 2014, a different approach was offered in the form of this, the ZXC4, available from Paul Farrow's website. Others came before it, but this is the latest version. It's a ROM cartridge, but one with a few differences. It plugs into the standard ROM interface, including Sinclair's, and has 4 megabytes of storage. Not only that, but you can write your own games directly to it, including 48k titles and even 128k titles, without the need for EEPROM burners and other such devices. Let's start by getting some games on it then. To do this you'll need Sinclair's Interface 1. We need the serial port on this, along with a serial cable that Paul sells if you need one, to allow the transfer of games. You can of course build a cable yourself if you prefer. With Interface 1, Interface 2 and the ZXC4 all connected to your Spectrum and the serial lead connected to your computer, you'll need to load up the software that comes with the ZXC4. The Cartridge Creator program allows you to build your own compilations to be written to the ROM. I grabbed a few games I wanted to test with, a mixture of 16k titles, 48k titles and a few ROM images. The unit will accept a variety of formats including Z80, SNA, SZX and of course ROM. To create your ROM compilation you simply drag the files into the Creator program and once you've got them in there you can then edit the title, publisher and year etc. You can also order them by title, publisher and size, until you're happy with what you've got. Adding a publisher and year is quite useful, particularly if you want to sort, and also the information shows up when you're selecting the game from the finished ROM cartridge. As you can see here, I've got 22 games in this collection, and there's still 3.6 megabytes free on the ROM, so you'll get a lot of titles on here. I'll stop at this point though, as there was enough variety to test with, and obviously writing to the ZXC4 takes a little bit of time. There are a lot of settings in this software, but I found leaving everything as it was works fine, obviously apart from adding the year and publisher and changing the names where needed. Once you have your compilation ready, you can save it out in case you want to modify it later. Now it's time to write the whole thing to the cartridge. I didn't mention the PC serial settings. I set mine to 57600 baud at 8N1, as per the instructions. Now, with everything plugged in, you set the ROM to accept the data, click the send button, and the data should begin to flow. This is my PC sending data across the serial link into interface 1, that is then writing the data onto the ROM cartridge in interface 2. How cool is that? For the 22 games listed it took about 3.5 minutes to write, and when it's finished you can unplug everything from your Spectrum apart from Interface 2 of course, and boot it up. For this demo I've swapped to the larger TV, because it's easier to film. I've swapped the Interface 2 for the RAM Turbo as well, mainly because that's got a reset button which is very handy when using this ROM. On booting up you get a very nice menu, and picking the game is easy, you use the cursor keys to go up and down the listing or you can move left and right across pages. Let's try Jetpack then. Yes, loads fine. This was the ROM image if you remember. Now let's go for Manic Miner, a 48k title. This was a Z80 file.
there you go, no problems at all. And you can see how fast the games load. On to Attic Attack. Well, that took about, what, one second? Probably less to load. The amount of space may not sound a lot, but you can fit many, many games into that 4 megabytes. Most people have a set of favourites, and this is a great way to load them. Although the cartridge is modern, the method for loading, although slightly tweaked, is very much authentic. Like I said before, it's even better if you have a ROM interface like the RAM Turbo with a reset switch, because once you've finished, just a simple press of the reset switch will bring back the menu without you having to unplug and plug in the power supply again. A nice idea and very well implemented, and ideal if you have a set of games that you keep coming back to. And even if that list does change, you can always rewrite the ROM cartridge. It's very quick and very easy. I'm amazed at how this works, how the PC link works, how the software works, and how it manages to bypass the 16K limit. Brilliant. Now, for some more gaming. Operation Wolf was released into the arcades by Tato in 1987. This shooter on rails featured light guns attached to the cabinet and proved a huge success. You had to fight your way through six levels, killing enemy soldiers and rescuing hostages, and a girl in a bikini for some reason. The Spectrum version was released in 1988 by Ocean Software, and was a brave attempt to bring this game to Sinclair's machine. I'll be reviewing the disc version of the game, released for the Plus 3. The game includes a cut-down version of the arcade's intro sequence, but at least it's there and not left out. On to the action then. The screen ratio is much smaller on the Spectrum and feels squashed when compared to the arcade version. However, all the elements seem to be there. Backgrounds are nicely detailed and scroll smoothly, and the cast of enemies pop up as you'd expect. Control is via keyboard or joystick, and there's even a version that works with a light gun if you want to get that extra arcade feel. Moving the crosshair you can target the enemy soldiers and take them out before they shoot at you. Things soon hot up though with jeeps, tanks and helicopters arriving, not to mention the grenades and knives being hurled at you continuously. You can shoot these if you are fast enough. Your ammo runs down, but you can refill this by shooting the ammo packs left on the ground. The Spectrum has all six areas, and the graphics change to try and imitate the arcade scenery. To see these, I had to use the RZX playback. The second level is the jungle, complete with boats and chickens. The third is the village, complete with girl in bikini. Well, in the arcade version at least. The Spectrum version seems to have given her some clothes, if that is her, of course. The fourth is the powder magazine, and the arcade throws in mortars to contend with but these are missing from the Spectrum version. We do get the large men with the huge machine guns though popping up, as well as the flying bird that can be shot for comedic effect. The fifth section is the concentration camp, and there are added objectives here of rescuing five hostages who wander across the battlefield without a care in the world. These appear on the Spectrum version too, although it is difficult to differentiate them from the soldiers. There's also no speech when they say thank you, like they do in the arcade. And finally the airport. Here you have to protect the hostages as they try and board a plane on the runway. The arcade game sees the plane taking off, and you have to shoot the helicopters as they chase it. This part is sadly missing from the Spectrum version though. Also missing for obvious reasons are the cutscenes at the end of each level. The arcade version has some nice graphics and speech, However, the Spectrum version just has text. But each separate level is faithfully recreated, which is a great accomplishment. 
As you can see, the graphics are monochrome, which can sometimes make it hard to spot things like knives until they're almost stuck in your head, but overall it works really nicely. Sound is average, I think. There are some tunes, which can sometimes get annoying if you're trying to get back into the action straight away, and the in-game sound effects could have been a little bit better. Using the keyboard is tricky, using the joystick is even trickier, but once you get the hang of it, you can usually get a decent game out of this. Having used and tested several light guns, I think this game could have been disappointing if used that way. And although you might get a feeling like the arcade, you also get a feeling that you're not hitting things you should be. Overall then, quite a nice conversion. The arcade version of Cavalon, I think that's how you pronounce it, was released by Jetsoft in 1983. The game has you on a mission to rescue a maiden on the top floor of a castle. To do this you have to collect 8 pieces of a door per level that allows you to progress up the floors. In your way are a lot of knights and archers that you need to avoid or kill. I found the arcade game a bit annoying to be honest, so let's try the Spectrum version. Released in 1984 by Ocean Software, we get a good rendition of the intro. And then it's into the game. The maze is well represented, and the main character looks like the arcade counterpart. The sound is well produced too, and the movement is smooth. You can fire at the chasing knights, but the archers are a real pain to kill. Once they're in the line of fire, they will shoot, and all too often, it's the repeating instant death syndrome. Once killed, you go back to where you died, and then instantly get killed again. That's very, very annoying, and bad game design. The archers fire too quickly and too often, making this game almost impossible. You have a number of Excalibur swords, and using these will remove the enemy for a short period. Replacement Excaliburs do appear from time to time floating around, and if you need them you have to risk your life. There are also other items to be collected for points. Damn, this is impossible. I have no idea how anyone could possibly play this. Even the RZX is using immunity pokes. The idea is fine, and the graphics are fine for 1984, the sound is okay too, it's just the difficulty is way too high, making a very frustrating game to play, and one I won't be going back to. This is Star Trek 3000, an early game released by DKtronics in 1983. If you are unfamiliar with the Star Trek genre, then this game gives you very little clues about how to play it. There's nothing on the inlay that explains the game, but when the game loads, there are a few pointers to the keys to use. You are the captain of the Enterprise, and your job is to destroy all of the Klingons in the galaxy. The galaxy consists of 8x8 eight eight quadrants, and each quadrant is split into 8x8 eight eight sectors. Each sector can have stars, bases, or Klingons present, or a mixture of any of those, and you have to track them down and try not to get blown up. This is a text input game, so there's no fancy 3D graphics here. Doing a long-range scan by pressing L will show you the adjoining sectors, in the top right hand of the screen, and in this view you are always in the middle sector, although there is nothing that indicates this. The numbers in the sector indicate the number of stars, bases and Klingons, so for example if the number is 1, 2, 3 that means there is 1 Klingon, 2 bases and 3 stars. Using a short range scan by pressing S, and you will see what is in the current sector, displayed in the top left of the screen, and here you will be able to see Klingons, bases and stars in more detail. To move around you press the W key for warp, and enter how many steps you want to move, and these are the steps as shown in the short range scanner. 
You then enter the direction you want to move in, and this is based on compass points. Luckily, there's an on-screen help for this. So, for example, if you wanted to move down, you would enter 180. At the start of the game, there is an option to allow Klingons to move around, just to make it that little bit harder. You have two weapons at your disposal, photon torpedoes, which fire in a straight line, and phasers, which fire in all directions, but uses your ship's energy, and diminishes the further away the target is. So let's go find something then. Here we've got a Klingon, on the short range scanner. They're firing at you, and the alerts appear at the bottom of the screen, and it's a turn based system. The game now waits for your input, and keeps beeping until you do, which is very annoying. Warping around to align your ship, you can press T, and then a direction, using the compass points as mentioned before. As you move around, you get random events, such as flying into black holes, or encountering a space storm, and these have varying effects on your ship. As you move about and use phasers, your energy is decreased, and it also does this when you take damage during a fight. You can get a report of your current status by pressing D for damage report or R for a general report. If you need to repair damage or get more energy, you can visit one of the randomly placed star bases. To do this you just fly into it, or more accurately, fly next to it, using the warp method as described before. Once knocked, which is automatic, your energy and torpedoes are replenished, and you're ready for some more Klingon bashing. One problem that I found is during the long range scan and warping about, I hit three black holes back to back. These do no damage, but do increase the energy of your ship by a random amount, and at this point I had 9,999 energy points. I was running out of torpedoes at this point, so I docked with the starbase, and that renewed my energy, however that put it back down to 6,000, which was very annoying. This style of game dates back to around 1971, so it's nothing new, and there are other implementations for this on the spectrum. It's a slow-paced, strategic game that might appeal to some people, and I found it quite relaxing to play, flying about, destroying Klingons and trying not to get destroyed. Now if you could only find a way to switch off that terrible beeping, well, the game's written in basic, so a quick look around, and if you go to line 51 and remove the beep command, it will work without those annoying beeps, and it works so much better without them. Not a bad game, and I found myself quite enjoying it. This is Escape from Monjas, released in 2021 by Rastasoft, and I have to say, I love this game. It starts with an intro sequence that sets the scene really well, and soon you find the game has a great sense of humour. You control Captain Pink aboard a space station, with a crew that each have their own character. You're unhappy here, and need to get off, and an incoming spaceship could be your chance. This is a kind of arcade adventure, you move around, examine things, talk to the other crew members, and soon their characters and story come to life. Early on in the game, the radar picks up a ship, and you soon find out that you have to sort it out yourself. The ship duly arrives, and then your chance to escape is presented, but not until you've collected a few items and done some tasks first. The graphics are brilliant, some really nice backgrounds, and the characters are really well designed. The control mechanism is spot on and easy to use, and you'll have great fun working your way through the puzzles. My only criticism is the font, and it would be really nice with a custom character set. Also it's too short, we need more please. 
a great game then that's highly recommended. Welcome back, Alan. Now we saw Asteroids RX in the last uh, episode, and you've done more RX games. You've done Bruce Lee RX and Jetpack RX, which we'll come on to in a minute. What was amazing to me is that Rouse wasn't an RX game, because obviously that is a, an arcade clone as well. Yes, well, I hadn't come up with the idea for that sort of little moniker at that point. It started with, my, the first game that I published was a game called Terrapins, which yep. uh, I, I know you reviewed on the show, so thanks for that. Yeah, so Terrapins was the, fir was the first game that I, I published. And then, uh, for a bit of fun, I was messing about with the graphics from the game Rally X. I'm sure you know that game, and it's a, yeah. it's a game that I liked. And I was thinking, of, I was toying with the idea of doing a version of Rally X, but obviously someone has done a version of that. But I put the graphics then into Terrapins to make this kind of mashup between Rally X and Terrapins. And that was the first time I used that RX. It was actually Terrapins RX, oh, Terrapin, right. ter Terrapins Rally X, if you like. But then, when it came to Bruce Lee, I thought, well, maybe I could use this again and call it Bruce Lee Remix. And also, it kind of changed into the idea of it also being Redux, which is like re redoing something, you know. When you pick these games, do you not worry that people are going to say, you know, how, how dare you change Jetpack or how dare you update Bruce Lee? Because there are a lot of people like those games. Yes, you're absolutely right. Some people do say that. It's like a kind of sacred cow and how dare you and, uh, you know, and my response to that is usually, well, if you go and get your tape of Bruce Lee or Jetpack and load it into your Spectrum and see if I've changed it, because I haven't, you know, mm. you can go and play that game and uh, you can completely ignore my game if that's what you want to do. For me, first and foremost, I do it for my own personal interest and in, in education. I'm really interested in those old games. I'm really interested in how they work. I think it's, you know, it's fun. It's a way of kind of freshening things up. As things have gone along, I've become a little bit more ambitious with it. Don't what exactly do you do? What do you look to do on the on the RX games? What is it um, smoothness of movement? Is it better sounds? What, you know, what do you look at, at, at doing with them? Well, I, I suppose you could say when I started with Bruce Lee, it was just a, a small frustration that I had when I was 14 or 15 that it just doesn't look like Bruce Lee. The Commodore 64 one does. Yeah, frankly, I just wasn't that happy with the graphics. It felt like, you know, there's a lot of games that are con when they're converted, they are done in a way that is um, rushed to get the product out quickly. So they just converted the graphics and, and, and got it out as quick as they could. They didn't have the time like I do now to, to sit for three or four hours changing one pixel and another, you know. Yeah, so well, there were elements of the Bruce Lee game that were not... Not as good as I thought perhaps they could be. And so I just kind of changed the sprite, and then I started changing the backgrounds, and then I started digging into the code. And But right. again, it's all, it all comes down to, uh, to the fact that if you want to play, if you want to do that for nostalgia, you know, go play the old game. I haven't changed it. It's still right there, you know, mm. and so on. So that, that's how it kind of started, and, and especially those two games. So that was that. Was that. But then as things, as things have developed, of course, as I said, it's like a, a kind of archaeological thing for me. I like to dig into the code and learn, and I'm still learning assembly. Whereas the um, the Bruce Lee one was really just a skin. The Jetpack one, on the other hand, was uh, was was quite a lot more work. And um, with that one, I was never unhappy with the, with the graphics. I think you know the original graphics of Jetpack are the stuff of yes, legend, yes. right? Yeah, of course, yeah, people. Yeah. Like. I don't want to mess about with that too much, you know, but. Nevertheless, I did put a few little tweaks, and why not? A mm. few minor tweaks just to just to kind of make it make it feel a little bit different, you know. And added a little bit of color to the rocket. Did some particle engine. Didn't you add a novel collection thing from the? Is it the N sixty four game? I did. Yeah. Well, as 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 you pointed out, there are people that are quite protective. I put a lot of what would nowadays, I suppose, be called fan service into the game. Mm. You know, lots of little things that, that people would appreciate. So I, I, I kind of recoded items that you can collect, and I added references to almost uh, every Ultimate game. If you play the game, you can you can try and see. I think there's like 14 references. Right. There's a reference to all the games that, as I understand, were written by the Stamper Brothers. Are there any more RX games planned? Of course. All right. Not saying any more than that. <laughs> <laughs>
This is Horace and the Spiders, released by Sinclair in 1983. It was also one of the ten games that got released for the ill-fated ROM cartridge and Interface 2. The game sees Horace on a mission to kill spiders, and the game is in three stages. The first he has to climb the mountain. Well, really, that's just jumping over a spider and a small hump. Next he has to use the spider webs to get across the bridge. In here you time your jump so you can grab the web and make your way across. The spiders will begin to pull him up though, so you have to be careful. And the final stage is really a version of Space Panic. You move around the platforms and ladders, you jump up and down to make a hole, wait for a spider to fall into it, and then jump up and down on their head to kill them. Once all the spiders are killed, it's back to beginning with a slightly higher difficulty. The difficulty increases on the first level by adding more steps and more spiders, the bridge gets shorter webs, and the last stage gets more spiders to deal with. The graphics are typical horish, really. Large, but a bit bland. And the sound effects are limited to a simple zap when jumping, and a three-beep jump. For a 16K game, having three levels gives good value, I suppose, and the variety in gameplay adds to that. Some 16K games could only manage to have one of the three. It does get repetitive though, but there is a challenge there as the difficulties ramp up. But I've never been a fan of the Horrors games, as you probably know, and if I were to pick one, I would suppose it'd be this one. However, I wouldn't really use the word like. episode I'd like to announce this, the new book by Thomas Christie, A Very Spectrum Christmas. His previous book on the Spectrum, called A Spectrum of Adventure, was fantastic, and covered, obviously, adventure games. And this one concentrates on the festive theme instead. Each of the games includes screenshots, and in some cases, inlays. And the chapters describe the game, the company, the visuals, the author, the audio, and an opinion of the merits of the game. I did a feature on Christmas games for a festive special, but missed a lot of these. I didn't know there were so many. The book will be available now from the link on screen and in the description. I enjoyed flicking through this and reading about the various games with that holiday festive vibe. A great book and an ideal present for yourself or other Spectrum-loving member of the family. Robot Chase was published in Popular Computing Weekly in March 1984. It's a one-page listing split across two pages. You control a human being chased by robots on an alien planet, and the only way to kill them is to lure them onto the mines. When I typed this in, it all went very well, with only a badly named variable stopping it from working. When you play the game, there are two types of mine. Yellow ones that don't harm the robots but kill you, and green ones that destroy both you and the robots. When the game starts, the robots head straight toward you, so you have to manoeuvre around the screen to get them onto the randomly placed mines. It's a fairly basic game, but playable nonetheless. After each level, another robot is added, so things do get harder the longer you play. This is probably the first time it has been seen since it was published and will be available to download from my website very soon.